Greetings, John Denton here. I am the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, based in Paris. Under normal circumstances, I would be with you in person today. But as has become the normal for so many of us, I am instead speaking to you from my office in the French capital. I've been invited to speak on building resilient supply chains in APEC and facilitating global value chains. It's hard to imagine a more pertinent topic for APEC to be grappling with given how COVID-19 has shaken the foundations on which we have constructed the global economy, including global supply chains. But first, I want to expressly thank APEC and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs for the very generous opportunity to address you today. I would also like to specifically thank Julianne Merriman from DFAT and Lisa McCauley, CEO of the Global Trade Professionals Alliance, for personally extending this invitation to me. Friends, at ICC, our view of the profound shock to the global economy is rooted in our history, principles and practices. ICC was founded in 1919 amid the ashes of the First World War and while the Spanish flu gripped the world. The vision set forth by ICC's founders was both simple and bold, to promote peace and prosperity through international trade. The inspiration for this derived from the firm conviction of our founders that strong commercial relations between nations could help keep goods, services, and nowadays data flowing across borders without the need for troops. Today, ICC is the institutional representative of more than 45 million businesses in over 100 countries and is the only private sector organization with a permanent seat at the United Nations. We are independent, we are not for profit, we are politically unaligned and our mission is to make business work for everyone, every day, everywhere. How we do that in line with our founding mission has taken many forms over the years, from creating INCO terms as the world's essential terms of trade, to drafting the New York Convention that gave rise to international arbitration and enabled the founding of our world-leading arbitral court. In fields such as commercial law and trade finance, we set globally accepted standards and we increasingly focus on providing solutions to our global network, working in partnership with leading companies and organizations such as APEC, who want, as we do, to take action at scale to tackle some of the most pressing challenges we collectively face. At the ICC, we create policies, we set standards, we govern those standards, and we scale globally. We can act and lead in sectors of the economy when governments are unable to act. Naturally, our focus over the last few months has been making sure that business can survive and thrive following the unprecedented shock caused by COVID-19. Clearly, COVID has caused massive disruptions to operations, to regulations, to human resources, and of course, to supply chains. Fundamentally, it has transformed the way business keeps goods and services flowing. Beyond the tragic health effects, some of the biggest impacts have been on cross-border trade, which the WTO predicts will fall by up to one third this year alone. The fact that COVID has been both a demand shock and a supply shock simultaneously has naturally meant that supply chains have come under massive strain and actually increased scrutiny. Increasing scrutiny from companies themselves and increasing scrutiny from governments. First, the company side. One effect of COVID is that companies everywhere are exploring ways to build more resilience into their manufacturing and supply networks. For many executives, COVID has ushered in a change of mindset. For some, what was once considered efficient may now seem over-optimized. For others, just in time may be less appealing than just in case inventory strategies. All over the world, in every industry, companies are asking questions like, should we diversify or regionalize our manufacturing and supply network? Should we add backup production and distribution capacity? How can we re-optimize our inventory? How can we improve our risk monitoring capabilities? How do we deal with the increasingly complex and fast moving regulatory environment? And most fundamentally, how can we better respond to shocks? Naturally, the answers to these questions depend on the individual company's circumstances, its existing networks, its location, its sector, and its strategic objectives, among other things. 
but you should rest assured that companies are taking these questions extremely seriously. There is simply so much at stake. And for many companies, everything is at stake, especially for SMEs and micro SMEs, which have been disproportionately affected by border complexity and the economic downturn specifically. And of course, we are also seeing increasing scrutiny of supply chains from governments. Much of this attention is understandable. Governments, of course, have an obligation to ensure their citizens can access essential goods and services and to provide adequate supplies of the medical equipment needed to treat COVID. More broadly, governments have a legitimate interest in ensuring national security and promoting economic, social and physical well-being. And where there is a real prospect of companies themselves being unable to make their supply chains more resilient in areas that would affect fundamental national interests, there may even be a case for government intervention. But my friends, the reality is that supply chains have held up and proven quite resilient and agile through the COVID crisis. Let's not forget just how extraordinary the challenges have been the past few months. Supply and demand dynamics have shifted. Borders and markets have opened and closed, opened and closed again, and it goes on. Customers have changed purchasing patterns are increasingly buy online. Constant fluctuations in volume and routing have caused formidable logistical challenges. 90% of passenger flights were grounded, causing not only a decline in travel, and tourism, but also limiting belly space capacity for cargo. Uncoordinated national restrictions such as curfews and bans on deliveries in certain districts disrupted operations. Not to mention sudden changes to customs rules that severely hampered border processing capacity. And of course, almost everyone was trying to deal with all of this while working from home. And yet, we have all been able to buy almost whatever we need and of almost all of what we want. It is easy to focus on shortages and supplies, but these were temporary and small compared to how rapidly companies shifted. It did not take long before breweries were making hand sanitizers, shops suddenly embraced e-commerce to sell their wares, and the express delivery services somehow managed to ensure uninterrupted door-to-door -door supply of urgently needed goods. They got it done. They got it done with medical equipment, medicine and food. In short, a key lesson of COVID is not just how disruptive the pandemic has been, but how keeping markets open meant that market, the market could work and new supply chains could come on stream quickly for many goods. With that context, much of the government scrutiny we are seeing is little more frankly than a pretext for protectionism. Moves to onshore production lines is both misguided and only disingenuously linked to mitigating supply chain risks. Resurgent discussion on industrial self-reliance will, if unchecked, dramatically alter the landscape of global trade for the worse, leading to reduced production and increased product scarcity, reduced choice and higher prices, with consumers, of course, footing the bill. Supply chains that are concentrated onshore are simply more vulnerable to other kinds of shocks. A natural disaster or homegrown crisis could wipe out whole industries. And casting the problems of inadequate stocks of masks and ventilators as a failure of corporate supply chains or globalizations is just wrong. Governments lacking sufficient stockpiles of PPE when a pandemic strikes is a governmental, not corporate failure. Export controls and other beggar thy neighbor distortions that strain supply chains are governmental, not corporate failures. And the actions of some governments in unilaterally buying up all productive capacity for certain COVID treatments are governmental, not corporate failures. So what then is the role of government ensuring resilient supply chains? Three key principles should guide the response. The first principle should be to make supply chains more resilient. Please do not further disrupt supply chains, a sort of Hippocratic oath for trade policy. Attempts to manage or regulate supply chains will likely fail because supply chains themselves are incredibly complex. The average automobile contains 30,000 parts. Often manufacturing just one part entails crossing several borders and continents. Companies have enough difficulty managing their own supply chains. Governments, notwithstanding the collective competence and intelligence in this room, would have an extremely difficult time doing this for even one company, let alone an entire industry or economy. And let's not forget the 70%
70% of all cross-border trade involves global value chains. So disentangling them with the requisite surgical precision will be next to impossible. The second principle should be prioritize an economic environment conducive to trade and investment. Business know their supply chains better than governments ever can. Allowing companies the space to learn from the current pandemic and respond in kind is a better approach than trying to force sourcing decisions upon them. Protectionist policies taken even for the noble aim of increasing supply chain resilience will only undercut competitiveness and raise prices for consumers. An important corollary, as stated by APEC ministers on 25 July this year, and certainly welcomed by the business community, is that any emergency measures to tackle COVID-19 must be targeted, must be proportionate, must be transparent, temporary, WTO compliant, and minimally disruptive to trade and global supply chains. Equally important, will be supporting SMEs, not just because they employ around 80% of workers globally, because they form critical links in global value chains and never before has the imperative to enable digital technologies been so great. Bridging the digital divide, boosting internet penetration and helping MSMEs embrace digital will all be key elements in building a more resilient economy. For trade policymakers, the crisis has only amplified the importance of advancing the WTO plurilateral negotiations on e-commerce and harmonizing fragmented national rules on data governance, privacy, and consumer protection, which only act as a break on cross-border trade. Similarly, APEC countries should lead the charge to make permanent the moratorium on customs duties on electronic transmissions, the lapsing of which would dramatically increase business uncertainty and wreak havoc in the online economy just when we do not want it or want it least. Given the imperative for economic growth has never been greater, governments owe it to their businesses and citizens to create enabling regulatory environments to power the post-COVID recovery. The third principle should be governments must cooperate, cooperate and cooperate again. There are multiple lessons we can draw from recent experience of export bans on PPE. An obvious one is that countries were unprepared for the pandemic, unprepared, and should bolster their stocks for pandemics and other predictable emergencies. The second lesson, perhaps more important, is that we cannot let that same dynamic happen again with respect to vaccines. PPE nationalism was one thing. Vaccine nationalism is quite another. We strongly take the view that governments need to act now to create a political understanding that they will refrain from enacting any form of trade restrictions on vaccines, especially export restrictions and bans, and commit to cooperate on their global, rational, and fair distribution. Whatever companies, whatever actions companies and perhaps governments take to strengthen supply chain resilience ultimately will pale in comparison to the effects of an uncoordinated approach to vaccine access and distribution. We understand that politics are difficult and there will be strong pressures for governments to secure vaccines for their populace as quickly as possible. Yet absent global coordination, countries will bid against one another, driving up prices. Supplies will be limited to a handful of wealthy countries Healthcare workers and the most vulnerable in other countries will go unprotected. More people will die and a global recovery will take longer, crushing hard fought social and economic progress. Friends, vaccines don't work without vaccinations and vaccinations won't happen without a functioning global supply chain. We will need to reach 8 billion people, not just once, but many times, because no one is safe until everyone is safe. So allow me to conclude. Businesses are seized with the need for greater resilience in the face of COVID and other unknown future shocks. While the pandemic has been unprecedented in the scale of its shock, business remains best placed to identify pressure points and build in redundancy and flexibility. The best thing governments can do to help ensure companies are able to do that is to provide an enabling business environment and remain open to trade and investment. We must resist the silent, silent calls of protectionism and remain true to the task of improving the multilateral trading system so that it works for all. Friends, I hope you have fruitful discussions over the next few days and would invite you to engage with the ICC wherever you can and whenever you feel the need to actually get a good dose of the private sector's views. Thank you.
Okay. Yes. Okay. Well done.